<laughs> my name is Morgan. I'm 25. Uh, my pronouns are they and them, and I'm also the founder of Thirst. Thirst is a dating app for queer people of all genders. It's really rad. Uh, the beta had 15,000 user signups, which is awesome. Uh, and then we shut it down three weeks in, and I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Uh, but we're relaunching in two months, so check back, I guess, in two months. Uh, but how did I get here? Uh, I went to business school in Boston. I didn't like it. I also worked at an M&T startup. That was chill. <laughs> and then I went to art school in Brooklyn, and I really loved that. Uh, and then I came out, so I'm queer. <laughs> and I wanted to find an easier way to date, um, but I realized that the platforms that currently existed weren't that great for that. Um, and I realized that dating on other platforms consciously allowed for various abuses. So uh, when I use these other platforms, I won't name them uh, repeatedly, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I kept getting a um, message for uh, things that I really felt like impacted me emotionally and psychologically, and I was just trying to engage with other users. Um, so every founder of a dating app was white, and very few were queer, and I realized that the perspective that went into these platforms immediately made me uh, more invisible. And so there were very few that weren't white, and all of them had class privilege, so they were coming from a place of uh, romance and love looked different from how it looked for me and my friends. And so I began to ask myself questions along this development process, apart from, oh, what am I going to use, what language am I going to pick, but um, what is this experience, and how would they know what dating was like for me, and how did they approach their process, and how was it differing from mine? Um, and I also realized that I have a lot of privilege still, like I'm relatively able-bodied, um, I'm younger, um, I read as cis, even though I'm non-binary, and I realize there are folks who are more marginalized than me who are navigating dating, navigating love, and navigating connecting with other people. Uh, so I decided to build my own dating platform, which is ambitious, and my parents were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had to imagine or reimagine what safety and security looked like, because a lot of my friends were saying, that's a really cool idea, but also, I don't feel safe leaving my house some days, so that's cool, but dig a little deeper. Um, and so I had to ask myself these questions too. Was I safe online? So I just made a lot of assumptions while navigating various platforms and I realized I was doing things to kind of prevent abuses that other people shouldn't have to do. Like on Twitter, I just block a lot of people. Um, and that is a lot of work. That's emotional labor, that's literal labor. And we don't think about the folks who simply don't use platforms because they don't want to have to do that labor of preventing abuse. Um, so the majority of users who experience harassment of various forms and various violences um, usually exist at the intersection of marginalized identities. So when we think about historically the folks who are most privileged, those are the folks who often receive the benefit of any action, um, who are centered in these spaces. So when we think about Twitter and other platforms, it's cis white men creating platforms that best suit themselves. Um, so when we think about that narrow lens of how people are approaching, developing, and creating platforms, and then the security uh, and community policies that are influenced or that influence how users interact on these platforms, a lot of people are invisibilized in that process. Um, so when we think about dating apps, the same thing is true. And there's plenty of data supported by these other platforms uh, that say cis white men are centered on all of them. Um, and then as you scale out to the more marginalized users, you're labeled as undesirable or not worthy of love for these reasons. Um, and so my final question to myself in this development process and reanalyzing how I want to approach this was, do marginalized users, especially black and brown users, uh, get a say in how we're treated online? So what does it look like to not just accept policies on other platforms, but try to recreate our own? Um, so I think one key part is to understand that everything is created has an intention. And so folks created platforms um, with the intention to exclude because they didn't create them with the intention to include. Um, so when you have a processes that inherently centers uh, cis men in particular, like under platforms that allow you to swipe left or right, um, you're inherently marginalizing folks just by selection. Um, so I find that, especially on these platforms, a lot of uh, trans and non-binary non -binary users are used as fodder. So in between these spaces, you create a hierarchy of who is most desirable and who's least desirable um, in a cis heteronormative space where um, violence is now allowed and accepted. So we're hoping to solve these problems. It feels ambitious. Um, and not going to lie, when we first launched the platform, we were terrified. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of problems and a lot of issues. And many of them stem outside of tech themselves and more into social issues that need to be addressed as a larger um, scale project. 
Um, so we want to prioritize safety and security as well as community accountability um, above the normative daming culture that exists on these other platforms where users are allowed to harass and abuse other people simply because of their own perspective, um, their desirability, or their willingness to connect or empathize with other people. Um, so through this process, we're hoping to create a system and then ultimately a platform where users feel like they can connect more freely and not be judged um, or receive harassment or other types of violences simply for who they are. Um, so these are our goals. I'm just gonna go through these relatively quickly. Um, and these are tailored for our platform, but I think they can fit uh, any platform that allows users to interact, especially users who are more marginalized. Have clear community goals and expectations. And this is a huge number one. Um, we spent many months actually thinking about what an intentional, safe, and secure community, me community means for all people. Um, not just those who are most privileged, not those who have access to the community already, but um, really asking ourselves deeper questions of who isn't present in our communities and for what reasons and how do we bring them into the uh, space, not only to give them space to talk, but also to impact uh, the policies that we're actively creating. And so the larger question is who, exclude, who is excluded from being respected online? Um, and I feel like online culture as a broader term in terms of how we interact online through these various platforms, but especially apps, um, reflects a lot of our larger culture um, around uh, colonialism and the impact that it has on certain bodies where bodies are privileged based on your skin color, based on your perceived gender and sex, based on your perceived attraction, your base, uh, perceived class. And so all these things are now filtered onto how we interact on a space that mirrors our lived experience. Um, so the who, who is seen as worthy of love is a larger question that we're not gonna try to fix or change or address because it's a much larger social question. Um, but we're simply trying to make users more aware when they enter any space that we create um, to reevaluate and really question how they have an impact on other users. Consider research. We spent many, many months doing a lot of surveys. Um, not a lot of people like surveys, but we love them. <laughs> um, and I'll, we're trying to figure out uh, the information that's missing that's not widely available. Who feels more freely able to answer these questions and who feels as if answering these questions is either emotional or psychological burden? Um, who feels that maybe their answers, their lived experiences aren't as valid as others and for what reasons? And how can we find that information? So it's different levels to that because there's privilege in being able to give an answer. There's privilege in being able to share your lived experience and there's also a lot of privilege in feeling like your lived experience will be seen as valid and true the first time. Um, and so there's a lot of depth in that because we realize a lot of the folks that we wanted to hear from, we might not hear from the first or second or even third time. So finding creative ways to really get that information that would best influence um, how we develop this platform was super important. So we spent a lot of time on that. Design shouldn't be oppressive. Um, I learned a lot from a lot of friends around this one. I'm not a designer by any means. Um, I struggle with a lot of UI changes where people are like, use more than one color. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is gonna be very colorful, I learned about that. But um, our beta screens were very, very basic, um, but we tried to have design preferences that reduced uh, binary preference for certain genders. Like on other platforms, you have uh, male, female, and then you scroll down to other, and it allows for that designation, but that experience inherently allows folks to other themselves, and that might be emotionally impressive for a lot of folks who are saying, I'm not gonna go that, I'm not gonna other myself on a platform that forces me to pick a box in order to be included. Um, so every design choice really does have an impact on the user from, from something as small as how do you designate someone, what is the list in which they are uh, listed, um, the hierarchy of which they are listed, sorry, and just really thinking about the impact of what matters most, what matters least to me, and what is what perspective going into that decision. Uh, preventing doxing and user identity theft. Uh, this used to keep me up at night. Um, thinking about when you're storing user information, many of the profiles were unique. Um, so we got a lot of emails for folks saying, I've never been on a dating app before. I'm thinking about using this one. That's actually awesome and terrifying. Um, you're now wondering about the lengths in which certain communities will go to kind of expose databases, trying to find that information, try to cross-reference from various other profiles. Um, and then we realized we had a much larger issue where we had to create not only just a policy, but a protocol for actively uh, encrypting data, figuring out different services that also had great uh, privacy policies and security policies in place. Um, I mean, security in itself is a mess and a lot of people are being exposed and exploited, but we're trying our best to really be ahead of the curve and make sure that users feel like when they sign up, um, they're with people who care about their information. 
uh, dedication to constant learning and improvement. Um, so this is a big one for us. When I first started, I actually had no idea that these problems would even exist, and that's um, evidence of my own privilege, too. I just wanted to create a platform to connect with other queer people because I was like, that sounds awesome. Um, and then as the harassment and violences kept manifesting, I realized it's a constant process. It's a constant battle against the very suppressive forces in our world that try to uh, interact indirectly and directly impact users who are navigating all platforms, regardless of which ones they choose. And it's our job to kind of create that bubble of a safe haven for folks who kind of want to change that, it, whether in the, it's a temporary space or just in between users, kind of redefine what living and loving and connecting means for them. And ultimately, love can take many forms. And so we realized at the end of our process, um, creating a space that's both safe and secure is super important because it allows people to fully be themselves. Uh, when you feel like you're being seen and heard, then you allow yourself to be fully uh, present. You can express yourself, and then that allows for connections that simply haven't happened before. Um, we're really entering a new era where a lot of users are saying, I can be myself, I can be validated in my identity, I can have my pronouns respected, I can also now look to connect with other people in any way um, on an online platform. And that's what's really exciting for us, ultimately, is like creating that safe space, hopefully so uh, folks can just be themselves and find the love that they deserve. Thanks. Also, while I'm walking, where can we give you money? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you can email me and I can send you a link. I'm sorry, I'm still working on the website also. Um, hi, I'm Iris. Um, I'm all the way from Sacramento, so this is really exciting to be here. Cool. <laughs> um, I think for me as a queer person of color, I think one of the hardest scenes I've been having dealing with is trying to communicate the importance of intersectionality and like, um, you know, like, and also like why like decolonization and like queer feminist practices are important to mm -hmm. development applications because they're like, oh, like, but what about the money? Like, I literally went to a hackathon at UC Davis and we tried developing an app and they were like, how are you going to monetize this? <laughs> and I, I was... I just left, honestly. Um, so I, I think, I think to me, it's like I'm just trying to understand. Like, it's like for you, like, like you making this app is so important for so many people. Um, but I'm wondering, like, how do you navigate developing an app like this, like with your praxis and this practice in a super white cis male dominated tech space where people are trying to get, trying to, they're, they initially are skeptical and they don't know what you're offering. And are they mm -hmm. even going to put in the emotional labor of doing that? Right. So I'm just curious about how your experiences have been with navigating that. Um, initially it was super difficult just because I think um, there were a lot of cis white men who were saying this is a great idea, let's monetize immediately and sell ads and try to, and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I don't think you get it. Um, but I am just really thankful for the community I've found, especially here in the Bay Area, of just uh, a lot of queer developers, a lot of developers who are black and brown and have the same radical um, perspective, I would say, who really are supportive and help me with just uh, connecting with people who would either support us long-term or short-term, um, and then just meeting with folks who really got it. So I think um, having hope that there are people out there who do understand and do have influence to kind of make things happen. Um, so we, right now we have a ton of mentors, a lot of support, a lot of advisors, a lot of people who do code reviews for us, which is really nice. Um, we have a lot of VCs interested who are queer women, which is really rad. Um, a lot of black and brown folks who are like, I'm here for this, and it did take many years, like at least a year and a half to find those folks, um, but it is happening, which is like really exciting. I didn't think so. Um, I thought we were gonna have to sell to match.com. <laughs> so, um, so it's been really nice to find that community. It just took a lot of like digging and a lot of asking and a lot of tweeting um, to really just reach out to folks and have folks reach out to me as well. Okay, so um, I think this is really cool. Uh, I'm queer and I've been working in security and privacy, privacy for a year and a half um, and security for longer than that. So this is really um, awesome. I wanted to ask about, my name is Rosalie, by the okay, way. Okay, cool. I think you're cool. Thanks. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to ask about, I almost forgot my question. Okay, um, I wanted to ask about like what kind of, what was the most interesting design changes that you've had to make because of, that you've had to make because of security and privacy? And did you, did you have to think about or, and implement any kind of like, like community vetting, digital community vetting um, to keep 
to keep people safe from from those who would harass or otherwise like try to out people or whatever it is um, that they want to do. Yes. Um, so our first design choice was to remove location, which is ineffective for quick matching, but ultimately we weren't figuring out, we didn't figure out how our data was uh, best stored, and so we just didn't want to have a lot of location information available for users who uh, were more marginalized and felt like they were uh, making more available than they wanted to. Um, so while we were figuring out how to best manage uh, user profiles, we were kind of removing things um, as we went along. And also, I feel like design-wise, we tried to allow people to upload photos that weren't used on other profiles. Um, so just the intentionality around like, what is your profile like, making sure that there aren't uh, social media integrations like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, um, so that there wasn't a ton of information that could be cross-referenced elsewhere. Um, in terms of the search, people found it really clunky, but that was intentional for the beta. We weren't sure what was gonna happen. Um, we were expecting best case scenario. People were like, we love this. Can you make it more efficient? Worst case scenario, I'm being harassed every minute. We were closer to the worst case scenario. And so I think um, that design choice prevented a lot of folks from more harm. So a lot of the harm was done through messaging, but not actually location-based or otherwise. So that was something we were very aware of, of just like treading lightly into that space. Thank you. Cool, thank you.